Antifungal resistant fungi have been in the news and even the subject of the popular TV program, The Last of Us. Today we'll be talking with two experts in mycology and fungal susceptibility testing about the recent descriptions of antifungal resistant dermatophytes in the United States. Some of the questions we will address include, first, what are the manifestations of infections caused by terbinafine resistant dermatophytes? Second, what species, including novel species, of dermatophytes are more commonly resistant to terbinafine? And third, how common is terbinafine resistance in dermatophytes in the U.S.? Welcome to Editors in Conversation. Please subscribe to this podcast and rate or review it. Seriously, please rate it. It really <laughs> helps people find the podcast. This episode is brought to you by the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, available at jcm.asm.org and on Twitter at jclinmicro. I'm your co-host and JCM Editor-in-Chief, Alex McAdam. Editors-in-Chief is supported by the American Society for Microbiology, which publishes JCM. If you are a member of ASM, you can get up to 50% off publication fees when you publish in JCM or in any of the ASM journals. I am joined by my co-host, Dr. Ellie Thiel. Ellie is an editor of JCM and a clinical microbiologist at the Mayo Clinic. Ellie, how have you been? I've been pretty good. Um... How was your summer? Summer, I think I think we overdid it uh, this summer, yeah. but in my defense, it was a really bad winter when we planned all our vacations in Minnesota <laughs> last year. So you were traveling? Yeah. So we did a week in Florida, okay. um, two weeks in Bulgaria, and then uh -huh. a week in the Dominican Republic, and my kids never want to go to a beach again. So, so that's fun. <laughs> so four weeks all together. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. It was it was good. Did you good. have a similarly fun summer? I had three days in New Jersey. <laughs> that was also very nice. <laughs> I'm sure it was very relaxing those three days. <laughs> yeah, it was great. It really was great. Good, good, good. Um, good. All right, four weeks of vacation. Boy, yeah, my lab pretty good uh, out there. May have forgotten what I looked like, but. You know. <laughs> Well, we are also joined by return guest, Dr. Sean Lockhart. Dr. Lockhart is a clinical advisor at the Centers for Disease Control, where he is an expert in medical mycology. Sean was an editor on a paper in Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report that described two cases of tinea caused by a terbinafine-resistant dermatophyte. Sean, it's great to have you back. Thank you for having me. And we are also joined by Dr. Nathan Waterhold. Dr. Waterhold is the director of the Fungus Testing Laboratory and a professor at UT Health San Antonio. Nathan has a paper in press at JCM titled, Terbinafine Resistant Dermatophytes and the Presence of Trichophyton Indochiniae in North America. We will put a link to the paper in the show notes. Nathan, welcome to Editors in Conversation. Happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Let's start with some clinical context about these infections. Sean, can you tell us about the two cases of tinea caused by trichophyton indotinia that were described in the MMWR report? Yeah. So the two cases were two young women in New York. The first was a 22-year-old female. Um, she had really bad scaly, puritic, so itchy lesions all over her neck, abdomen, groin, and, and buttocks. When she showed up in the clinic, um, She'd had it since the summer of 2021, and this was early in, in January of 2022. So it had been going on for quite a long time, and it had been spreading. Um, they started her on two weeks of terbinafine, and she showed no recovery at all. The plaques were actually getting larger instead of smaller. They switched her over to um, itraconazole, and she started to get better. The second patient was a 47-year-old woman who'd been visiting family in Bangladesh. And some of our members of her family had these rashes on their, their trunk and um, in their groin and, and buttocks. And while she was there, she started developing these rashes as well. About six months later, she started going to the clinic back in the United States. They first gave her hydro, um, hydroxycortisone, thinking that they just knock it, you know, it wasn't infectious. Then she showed up again and they gave her clotrimazole, um, which I'm not sure why they gave that one. And then finally, um, they gave her two weeks of terbinafine. That didn't work. So she showed up at the hospital. They gave her four weeks of terbinafine. And she showed no improvement again. So um, they started on griseofulvin, and after eight weeks, she started to get better. The thing that's 
most outstanding about this case or the first cases is that the, the first woman had not left New York. So that was a locally acquired case. It, it wasn't surprising um, that, that the woman who had visited family who had rashes came back with the rash. But, but the other, other um, young woman had acquired that case there, right there in New York somewhere. Hmm. Interesting. So, Sean, Indo, uh, trichophyton indotinia, it's a relatively recent, uh, recently described species of trichophyton. So can you tell us a little bit about how it was discovered and kind of what its close family members are within the trichophyton genus? Sure. So there's a, a, a group of species or a species complex called trichophyton mentagrophytes, and that is a zoonotic infection. In We've just started to, to divide that up um, on the, a couple different bases, biochemically, but also um, because there's another species called Trichophyton um, interdigitale that's not zoonotic, that's anthropomorphic. Um, so we knew there were more than one thing rolling around in that Mentagrophytes group. There was a... Um, it, it was divided into eight molecular types, and one particular molecular type was noted for two different things. First, the severity of the lesions caused by that particular um, molecular type, and second, that up to a third of the isolates were resistant to terbinafin, which had been relatively rare in that Mentagrophytes interdigitale group. So a, a good friend of mine in Japan did some molecular work, some, some whole genome sequencing, and showed that they really were different. And, th and that work's been followed up by a couple different groups. There are some biochemical differences. It is anthropophilic rather than zoonotic like, like Mentagrophytes. And on a genomic scale, it, it looks different enough that they decided it was a new species, and they called it um, Trichophyton indotinia, broke it away from Mentagrophytes. Interesting. Um, so, you know, since they're so closely related, uh, you know, what are their challenges to identifying trichophyton endotinia uh, in the laboratory? Yeah, yeah, real challenges. So, you, you know, the only way to do it is really by doing it molecularly. You, you really need a DNA sequence. I imagine if you have a good enough database, you could probably do it with Malditoff as well, but, but those are going to exist on the individual lab scale. Um, luckily, you can do it just by an ITS sequence alone. And there are a few very good laboratories in the United States that can do that. A few public health labs, of course, Nathan's lab, um, and, and some, some nice um, hospital labs that can do DNA sequencing. But that's what's required. In general, really, the only way it's been noticed both here in the U.S. and other parts of the world is, is by the severity of the infection and the fact that it's resistant to terbinafin. And so by the time you recognize it, it's because it's become such a severe infection. And that's horrible for our patients. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Nathan, we'll be talking about antifungal resistance in uh, T. indotinia and other dermatophytes. Can you start us off by reminding us of the mechanism of the antifungal activities of azoles and terbinafin? Sure. Uh, so ultimately, both the azoles and terbinafine uh, inhibit the production of ergosterol, which is an important component of the fungal cell membrane. So the azoles do this by inhibiting the enzyme uh, linosterol 14 alpha dimethylase, uh, there, thus preventing the conversion of linosterol to ergosterol, which is actually the last step in that biosynthetic uh, pathway. Terbinafine, on the other hand, which is in a completely different class, it's an allylamine, inhibits the enzyme squalene epoxidase, uh, and that converts squalene to 2,3-oxido uh, squalene within the sungal membrane. Uh, that enzyme is actually upstream in the ergosterol biosynthesis pathway, but ultimately it also results in the reduction of ergosterol, which is a, a very important component uh, of uh, fungal cell membranes. Thank you. Um, so getting into your paper, uh, Nathan, what was kind of, what was the overall goal of the study? 
We really had a kind of a two-part goal. First, uh, we wanted to assess uh, the terbinafine and azole susceptibility profiles of dermatophytes that we had received in our reference lab uh, from uh, institutions, primarily in the United States, but then also from a few uh, in Canada. And we wanted to do that over a two-year period, starting in 2021 and then continuing through 2022. And then secondly, in those isolates that we deemed to be resistant, uh, we wanted to determine if uh, trichophidin indontinia uh, was actually present. Uh, up to you know, There had been a couple of reports uh, of it being identified in Canada, uh, but when we really started to look for it, it had not yet been uh, identified in, in the U.S. Thank you, Nathan. How did you look at the frequency of resistance to azoles and terbinafine in the dermatophytes that were sent to your reference laboratory? So we tried to include uh, all dermatophytes that were sent to us uh, within that two-year period. And so for susceptibility testing, uh, we performed this by the psilocybe broth microdilution method uh, that's in the M38 document. So for those isolates uh, that were resistant to terbinafine, and now there's no breakpoint established uh, for terbinafine or against uh, any dermatophyte for any antifungal. So we had to kind of look into the literature and see what others were using to kind of uh, arbitrarily, if you will, uh, classify an isolate as being terbinafine resistant. And so for this particular study, we define that as having an, a terbinafine MIC of 0.5 micrograms per mil or higher. And so for any isolate uh, that had a uh, high terbinafine uh, MIC, uh, we went back and then did uh, species identification uh, by sequencing uh, the ITS uh, locus. Uh, in addition, in a handful of them, we also sequenced the uh, squalene epoxidase gene uh, in order to see what might be uh, resulting in the uh, terbinafine resistance. Thank you. So with your, you know, all of the, the data you acquired, can you tell us about kind of how commonly you identified azole and terbinafine resistance um, in those dermatophytes that your lab received during those two years? So what really stood out to me and was somewhat surprising uh, was the rate of terbinafine resistance. So in that two-year period, uh, we saw resistance to uh, that antifungal in just to over 18% of the isolates that we looked at. Uh, in contrast, we really didn't see an issue uh, with azole resistance. Uh, the, we had um, one uh, isolate that had a high itraconazole MIC of 2 micrograms per mil, but that one also had a very low terbinafine MIC. It was actually, uh, the MIC was either at or below the lowest concentration that we test. Uh, we did have one isolate that had an elevated voriconazole MIC. Uh, whereas in contrast, the fluconazole MICs were somewhat more variable, ranging from 0.25 to greater than 64 micrograms per mil, which is what others have reported, a lot of variability with fluconazole against dermatophytes. That is a strikingly high re rate of resistance to terbinafine. So let's dig into that a little bit. What species of dermatophytes were terbinafine resistant in, the, in your isolates? So this is also something that somewhat surprised me. So uh, of the 49 isolates that we had that were terbinafine resistant, uh, there was an equal distribution between T. indontinia uh, and then trichophidin rubrum, so 21 each. Uh, I, once we had seen terbinafine resistance and had identified our first trichophidin indontinia, I was like, okay, it's all going to be trichophidin indontinia. Uh, but then as we kept going and seeing more trichophidin rubrum, uh, th that kind of stood out as uh, somewhat surprising to me. We also had about a handful of other isolates, uh, a few T. mentagrophytes, uh, a few uh, trichophidin interdigitalis, and one uh, viricosum that were also resistant to terbinafine. But by far, uh, they were either uh, indontinia or rubrum that were terbinafine resistant. And just so, before we go, before we go on, Sean, you were nodding um, when Nathan was saying that the species distribution was somewhat surprising. What what strikes you about that? So, I mean, resistance to terbinafine in general in the U.S. has been very rare, and you know we we see reports overseas about um, about resistance, and we always think, oh, it's something that's happening to them and not us. 
part of the problem is, and, and this is one of the fantastic things about Nathan's paper, is really in the U.S., nobody looks. You know, it doesn't kill anybody, so we don't need to monitor it, you know, which is, of course is wrong. And, and we firmly believe we should be monitoring it, it you know, if the funding ex- existed. And so, you know, for him to go out and actually do it and say, hey, guys, it's here. We're seeing it. We've got to we've got to talk about this. We've got to tackle this. You know, for those of us at the CDC, we're going, yeah, all right. So, you know. <laughs> There, there'd been hints that the resistance might be there, but it's always just anecdotal. And it takes a study like this to, to really um, confirm it. And, and now people know we need to be looking. Mm-hmm. So kind of along those lines, Nathan, you make a point of this in your paper. Can we say that trichophyton endotinia is intrinsically resistant to terbinafine? I don't think we can say that it is intrinsically resistant um, in uh all the isolates that we had definitely were resistant to terbinafine. But if you go and look at other reports uh, that have come out of uh, India, uh, Europe, and other places, uh, they actually see resistance anywhere between 30 up to 60%. And so you can't really say it's uh, intrinsically resistant. If you have uh, a high proportion, uh, even if it's just 20%, that have low terbinafine MICs. That really doesn't meet the definition of intrinsically resistant. Got it. Thank you. So you also looked at some of your historical data, which I thought was interesting to see if you'd seen uh, terbinafine resistant isolates in your lab prior to 2021. Um, so what did you find? Sure. It's one of our favorite activities is the freezer diving we get to do. <laughs> so once we start to mine. see these, yeah. <laughs> So once we started to see these indontinia isolates, uh, we started to wonder if, you know, has this been around and we just haven't recognized it? And it also kind of goes back to the fact that uh, uh, indontinia is a relatively new described species. And so were we seeing it, but because it hadn't been described as a new species, we were just saying, oh, that might be something else different trichophidin. So we went to our susceptibility database uh, and did a query uh, looking for isolates that had uh, terbinafine MICs of 0.5 or higher. And we were able to identify 32 of those isolates uh, over a 20-year period from 2001 uh, through the end of 2020. Uh, Of those uh, 32 isolates, uh, all of which had terbinafine MICs of uh, two or higher micrograms per mil, three of them we found to be uh, Tion indontinia, with the earliest one uh, being received in our lab back in 2017. So it's it's been here in the U.S. for longer than we might Mm -hmm. uh, have originally appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. And Nathan, you mentioned earlier that you did some sequencing to look at mechanisms of resistance in the resistant isolates. So what did you find in the T endotinia? Sure. So we went back and looked at the uh, squalene epoxidase sequence in uh, 11 uh, of these uh, T endotinia isolates. And we're looking for variants that have been previously described as being associated with terbinafine resistance. Uh, and what we found was that there was a uh, variance that led to uh, phenylalanine to leucine amino acid substitution at codon 397 uh, in eight of the strains. And that mutation has been reported by uh, many other groups uh, to result in terbinafine resistance. Uh, interestingly, uh, that particular amino acid change was not present in the isolate that we found uh, back in 2017. <clears throat> Instead, there was a leucine to serine uh, amino acid change at codon 393, but that has also been associated with high-level uh, terbinafine resistance uh, in other uh, published manuscripts. Uh, but of those 11 isolates uh, that we did uh, squalene epoxidase sequencing on, only that one in 2017 had the uh, leucine to serine uh, amino acid change at that particular codon. The others did not. 
Thank you. So Sean, kind of getting back to you. So Nathan's um, study and in, in his other work, trichophyton endotinia was uh, nearly always associated with infection of the skin or, or tissue, but but not nails, uh, which is you know interesting. And you kind of alluded to that in your the two cases you talked about initi- uh, initially. So do you or does you know the CDC have any thoughts on why that might be? Um, and then do other species of trichophyton show tropism for certain body sites? Yeah, so that's one of the really cool things about that whole genus um, and, and, and other um, genera as well, like, like um, microsporum, is that they're really specific in what they like to digest and eat. And so that's specific to where they want to live. So you have some species that are specific to nails. Some people, some species will live on nails and, and skin and, or hair, some just hair. So, you know, you know, they, they all have their preferences for where they want to go to the restaurant and, and, you know, that determines their tropism. That was a really great description. Of- I love the idea of them choosing by food. <laughs> Sean, can you tell us a little, a little bit about what the CDC is doing to monitor for resistance to terbinafine and dermatophytes within yeah, the Yeah, yeah. It's so that that's where we're um, we're putting a lot of effort right now. You know, every once in a while we get somebody who has a, a really strong interest in an area, and and we just say go. And so we we have a um, a, a young MD and a, a young EIS officer who are very very interested in dermatophytes and and skin infections. Um, and it's been relatively unstudied, and so they got here at the exact perfect time. Um, you know, when, when endotinia is emerging. So first of all, we're working on um, communication and outreach. You know, we published the MMWR, we've done a Medscape, um, we've got a couple reviews and, and we've been doing talks because, you know, if nobody's looking for it, we're not going to find it. So if we can identify these infections before they become severe, you know, it's much, much easier to treat. And then second of all, we've been supporting um, research, both surveillance um, so looking for endotinia in, in various collections around the U.S., both prospective and, and respective, and also in, in susceptibility testing. There are very, very few labs that do any mold susceptibility testing in the U.S., maybe a dozen, and even fewer that do susceptibility testing on dermatophytes. So we, we've been promoting that and, and trying to, to help fund uh, more laboratories to do susceptibility testing in dermatophytes. Yeah, so kind of along those those lines, um, I guess this is a question to both of you, but we'll start with Nathan first. So what testing resources are available So, you know, to caregivers and, and lab directors who are concerned about terbinafine resistant um, dermatophytes in their, their patients or their, their isolates that they've cultured? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, right now, I think we're just kind of in the infancy of trying to build up uh, resources as well as uh, people's understanding of the issue here in the United States. Um, you know, Sean mentioned uh, that there are a few labs that do uh, mold susceptibility testing and even fewer that will test uh, against dermatophytes. We're one of those labs, and so um, we're happy to uh, accept specimens uh, from uh, other institutions for testing. And this is a study we've continued, and so we're continuing to look for it. Um, so far in 2023, I think we've had a total of 16 additional uh, or so uh, trichophenin isolates uh, that are terbinafine resistant. Um, and kind of following along the lines of what we reported, half of those are endontinia and the other half seem to be rubrum. And so it's kind of this pattern that's holding true. Um, kind of going back to another question that was asked earlier about how difficult it is to identify uh, endontinia. And John was exactly right. It's not an easy thing to do. But it's getting better, uh, especially now that there are some very good uh, ITS deposits in GenBank. And so if your lab uh, does ITS sequencing or can send it to another lab that does it, uh, the identification is uh, getting much easier. Uh, The other thing that people could consider, we haven't 
gone through and really evaluated this, but one thing that's been suggested in the literature is that if you're able to get it to the T. Montagrophyte species complex, one thing you could consider would be doing a urease test uh, because indontinia is supposed to be urease negative, whereas uh, Montagrophytes and interdigitalia is supposed to be urease positive. Uh, I think there needs to be some more studies to truly confirm that. But if that holds true, that might be a way for labs uh, that are at least able to get it to the T. Mintag species complex uh, to take it further uh, and then confirm that it, they might actually have indontinia uh, in their uh, cultures. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Sean, do you have any other suggestions for lab directors that <laughs> yeah. are worried? Yeah, so um, I, I know that the state public health lab in New York, Wadsworth, um, has been willing to accept isolates um, uh, that, that have been submitted to them. And, and, and since that MMWR, they, they've identified um, eight more isolates, so three hospitals so far in, in um, just in Manhattan that we know, and, and 10 isolates out of New York just in the last few months. And if you can get isolates to your state public health lab or your regional public health lab, they can forward those on to the CDC and, and we can do that. Um, we're not as fast as Nathan's lab, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we will get a, a, a definitive ID. Um, most most um, fungal infections are treated empirically anyway, so we, we hope your patient is already on antifungals. Um, but you know, for epidemiological purposes, because because it is spread anthropomorphically, it, it would be nice to identify those isolates and, and make sure that that patient is taking precautions not to spread it to, to other people. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you know, Sean said, you know, he's not as fast as our lab, but we're talking about trichophid and nothing's fast at all. <laughs> it's true. It's very, very slowly. That's true. That's true. <laughs> This has been a fascinating conversation. I, Alex, I, yeah. I have one more question, Go. not oh. necessarily associated with dermatophytes, but since we have Sean and Nathan <laughs> on here, The Last of Us, talk to me about how <laughs> real this is <laughs> and should my family be concerned? So I'll go first because you cannot imagine how many times I've gotten that question. That's why um, I'm asking it again. <laughs> so the, the nice thing is that the majority of species of, of cordyceps um, only in, infect invertebrates. Um, so there, there is very little chance of causing an infection in a, a mammalian species. They, they don't tend to grow over 30 degrees and hopefully we tend to be about 37, which, you know, makes it unlikely that we're going to get an infection. But the fantastic thing about that show is it's given us an opportunity to go out and talk about the fungi that do matter. You know, Hardly anyone thinks fungus, and that includes clinicians. You usually get a diagnosis of fungi after you've ruled out everything else, after you've ruled out bacteria, after you've ruled out viruses, then they, oh, maybe it's a fungus. <laughs> and so now we've got everybody thinking fungus. And so I love that show for that reason. <laughs> yeah, I think the first 10 minutes of that show, when they go into how <laughs> cordyceps went from, you know, 30 degrees to 30, I mean, it sounded real, you know? Yeah, yeah. Nathan, do you have thoughts on The Last of Us? Um, uh, just like Sean, I have had some interesting requests, uh, for a comment on it. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, it, it's not something I'm super concerned about just yet. So, you know, being in Texas, there hasn't been a run on any of the ammunition stores or anything like that <laughs> just yet. So, uh, nothing that I am taking too seriously at this point in time. Awesome. Well, now I feel better. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have not seen it. Oh, it's good. I haven't seen it. Even some of my good friends have told me to watch it. I haven't done it yet. If mm -hmm. you ignore the science, the show is fantastic. <laughs> awesome. Well, my enthusiasm for mycology greatly exceeds my knowledge of mycology. So this has been a lot of fun, and it's been very educational for me. Ellie, I can't wait to see what you pick for the next episode. Probably something about AST. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Nathan, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And Sean, thanks for coming back a second time. Ah, thanks for having me again. I really enjoy it. And thank you for listening to Editors in Conversation. 